partners, priests, and politics. Um, I start off with partners, and uh, I stand here with some trepidation, being aware that, for the most part, you are employed by LLPs, or are you, you are members of LLPs, and you probably know much more about LLPs than I do. Um, obviously, in relation to the Equality Act, there is express protection for members of LLPs, and indeed, express protection for partners. Uh, so, uh, the position in relation to discrimination legislation is quite straightforward. Uh, not so in relation to whether a person who is a uh, member of an LLP should be considered uh, to be an employee or a worker. So, our starting point is the Limited Liability Partnership Act of 2000. Um, and Section 4.4 of that, which talks about members of LLPs, shall not be regarded for any purposes employed by the limited partnership unless if he and other partners were in a partnership, so that takes us back to the 1890 Partnership Act, he would be regarded uh, for that purpose as being employed by the partnership. So it's an act which is designed to allow individuals to be both a member of the LLP and to be an employee, but to be taxed as partners. Uh, so we are aware that there are different types of partners within firms and we had in 2012 the Tiffin and Lester Aldridge case. Uh, Martin Tiffin was a salaried partner to begin with and was then admitted to the partnership as a fixed share partner. He had five profit share points. The full equity partners generally had about 200, between 100 and 200 equity share points. Uh, he signed a partnership agreement. Uh, when he was dismissed uh, by reason of redundancy, he wanted to bring a claim uh, for unfair dismissal and for a redundancy payment. It was held... Uh, at ETEAT and Court of Appeal, that he worked did not work under a contract for services, but he worked pursuant to the LLP membership agreement. So the leading judgment of the Court of Appeal is that of Lord Justice Rymer, who talked about uh, Section 4.4 of the Partnership Act and said that, unfortunately, those who drafted Section 4.4 of the uh, Limited Liability Partnership Act, was unaware that in law an individual cannot be an employee of himself, even if he is his hardest taskmaster. Uh, nor can a partner in a partnership be an employee of that partnership, because equally it's not possible for an individual to be an employee of himself and of his co-partners. Now, uh, I'm going to come on in a moment to Bates Van Winkelhoff against Clyde & Co. Uh, that was heard in the Supreme Court uh, last week and I enjoyed the Supreme Court live web link and uh, if not watched, listened to a lot of the proceedings. And in addition to the two employment silks uh, on either side in that case, there was another silk who was a specialist in issues of partnership. And he and uh, Lord Neuberger had a very long exchange about whether post the law of Property Act 1925, can A and B contract with A? I lost the live link for a good five minutes and when it came back in, they were still talking about whether under the LPA 1925, A and B contract with A. Possibly, no idea. Might be quite an important part of the judgment. We will wait and see. Uh, but in terms of what the problems of section 44 uh raise according to Reimer back in Tiffin, it's got to be interpreted. Reimer identified the problem and said it's got to be interpreted to avoid absurdity inherent in a literal application of the language. So you've got to interpret it in a practical manner. How do you do that? Well, at the bottom of page three of the paper, uh, he, talk, he, he says that we've got to assume that if the LLP had been carried on by two or more members as partners, so under the 1890 Act, 
would that person be one of the partners or, or would they be considered to be an employee? So Mr. Tiffin, um, he, it, when you're looking at Mr. Tiffin, have regard to the full equity partners and the fixed term partners, said Lord Justice Reimer, as being essentially the same, even though their commercial interests are different. They both contributed capital. They both had shared profits. They both had a voice in management. If on uh, winding up of an LLP, they would both have a share in the surplus. So these were all important factors. Now, uh, again, a topic which with which you will all be much more familiar than I am is the impact of the Finance Act 2014, because HMRC uh, have reviewed um, the way in which salaried partners are to be taxed. Uh, with employers' national insurance contributions running at 13.8%, this is a key area. Uh, and as I understand it, um, that the, the, the in order to continue to be taxed on a self uh, on a partner basis, uh, partners have got to fail each of the three conditions which have been set. Uh, condition A being 80% plus as a disguised salary. Condition B being to do with significant influence. Condition C being capital contribution of at least 25% of the disguised salary. So lots of LLPs are obviously requiring their salary partners uh, now to make capital contributions in order to continue to be seen as partners and therefore the firm not to have a liability for employer national insurance contributions. So these changes um, of taxation, uh, I think, bring into question whether, whether it will have an impact on questions of status, given that in Tiffin, uh, the factors that were looked at, which pointed to him not being an employee, were exactly these points about how his remuneration was paid, whether he had to make contributions and so forth. So at the moment, if we have LLP members not being employees, what about being a worker? Uh, and the facts of Bates uh, van Winkelhoff um, are, are if you accept the allegations as put forward, are quite startling. Um, Mrs. Bates van Winkelhoff um, was working in Tanzania and was part, she was a member of the Clyde & Co. Uh, LLP, uh, but also engaged in a joint, um, joint, joint venture with a Tanzanian firm the managing partner of that Tanzanian firm, ACO Law, told her that he paid bribes to secure work and paid bribes to secure the outcome of work. So she phoned Clyde & Co's whistleblowing uh, helpline. She was dismissed by the joint venturship, suspended uh, from the LLP, and then expelled by the LLP, so, so say her allegations. So she can bring her claims for sex discrimination and pregnancy discrimination, but can she bring a whistleblowing claim? Well, only if she is a worker. Uh, the ET said she wasn't. The EAT said she was. Court of Appeals said she was not. And the judgment of the Court of Appeal uh, was given by Lord Justice Elias. Uh, so not, not to be quickly discounted. Um, he... Uh, looked at Section 44 of the LLP Act uh, 2000 um, and applied the test which really had been enunciated by Reimer in, in Tiffin uh, um, about looking about whether would, would she have been a partner in an 1890 Act partnership uh, and if she would have been then said she can't be a worker uh, and he looked at the essential nature of the relationship between the parties. The Supreme Court have heard argument in this, uh, and essentially, um, and it appeared to me that those acting for Mrs. Van Winkelhoff got an easier ride than those acting for Clyde and Co. Whether that means anything, we'll see. Um, they, they 
were asked then to be a worker, is it enough for there to be personal service and it not to be a business relationship or a professional relationship along the lines of um, Jiv Raj and uh, Hashwani um, and the, the arbitrator type cases? Would this mean that all LLP members are workers? And the answer on her behalf was in the vast majority of cases, yes, all LLP members would be workers in, in the same way that shareholders can be employees. So whether, whether uh, the Supreme Court go that far, um, we will see. So what uh, interesting issues does this give rise to? Should whistleblowers have less protection than those discriminated against? Uh, it's it's a leading question. <laughs> um, I don't know. What's your view? Do you think that it's that that as a matter of politics, really, it's right that the um, that the protections are different, given the many similarities between whistleblowing provisions and discrimination provisions? Answers on a postcard. Do feel free to shout out. Uh, what about situations where the partner's got a duty to report the wrongdoing? Uh, if they, uh, bearing in mind that the allegation here is this is Mrs. Bates Van Winkelhoff phoned the Clyde and Co. whistleblowing hotline, and if she is then sacked for disclosing something that she has phoned their hotline to disclose, that doesn't really sit right. And Baroness Hale, unsurprisingly, seemed to be um, somewhat concerned uh, with with these kinds of policy points. What about other sectors? What about financial sectors? We, I and probably most of us in this room think of LLPs and we automatically think of solicitors firms. There have been a couple of the leading cases, but of course, LLPs are used in lots of sectors. So what about if there are obligations uh, imposed by bodies such as the FCA? Uh, should there not be protection there if they're acting pursuant to a duty? Is, is uh Will they have a duty to disclose and yet no protection? Um, should whistleblowing protection be given contractually in LLP agreements? Ought it to be a matter of contract? And will any of this matter after the Finance Act 2014? Or will that, will that change the landscape under which we're operating? All remains to be seen. Priests. Uh, I've included this for three reasons. Uh, the first of all, uh, is that there has been a recent Supreme Court case on the topic and in looking at status, I think it's right to mention uh, a 2013 Supreme Court authority. Secondly, I wanted a title for my talk which had three letter P's and the clergy lent itself by way of priests to that. And the third is that I have an anecdote which is relevant and uh, somewhat entertaining in, in my view as far as employment law anecdotes go is that I had the pleasure of being in the Court of Appeal years ago uh, when Lord Justice uh, Staunton remarked that whoever might be the employer or in charge of members of the clergy it wasn't God because we didn't have his email address to join them as party. Which brings me on to politics. Uh, Two very quick topics in terms of the politics of where we are. Uh, politics always plays a part in employment law, and we're, we're very, very keenly aware of it uh, with the introduction of tribunal fees and the possible uh, changes to that which have been announced, reviews of it that have been announced today. Um, despite the aims to reduce red tape and reduce pro uh, legislative provision, uh, across the board, but particularly in employment law, we have, uh, under this government, seen this new category of employees, employee shareholders. And I'm going to start with my bottom question. Has anybody in the room come across professionally an employee shareholder? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Fantastic. Um, they're not being widely used, is, is the perceived wisdom. And indeed, why would they be? If you don't trust a, a, a prospective employee enough for them to have the right to claim on fair dismissal two years down the line. Why would you want to give them a share in your business? Um, but why did it work in your case? Why was it a good it's idea? Entirely for the tax. Like quite a lot of people about it. Really? So because because um, they get their shares of between two thousand and fifty thousand yeah, pounds. 
yeah, and they can get their capital gain. So I suppose if they're, if they're starting to be used now, we might see them in due course. What's interesting to note, and, and this is set out on page nine of the paper, is that uh, although people who have taken the employee shareholder status can't bring a standard, an ordinary unfair dismissal claim or, or make a claim for a redundancy payment. Um, they cannot uh, opt out of the unfair dismissal exclusions. Uh, they still have the right to claim for automatically unfair dismissal. Uh, they still have the right to claim in relation to any dismissal, which would be a contravention of the Equality Act and in relation to health and safety uh, dismissals. So uh, it, it, it doesn't debar them from bringing claims entirely. The other area of politics with which we are, uh, which we're seeing a lot in the press about at the moment, is in relation to zero hours contract. And I commence this. It's quite apt that it's pointing at five two because I'm very aware that in five minutes it's time for you all to go upstairs and partake of a glass of wine. Um, so really, it's just to to raise a few questions under this heading. Um, Anne Sharp of the chief exec of ACAS uh, has. Uh, said at the beginning of this year that there's a lot of uncertainty about zero hours contracts, which leads to confusion, uh, and that there is a lot of there is perception that they are widely abused. For example, fast uh, workers in fast food establishments being told that they should turn up in uniform, uh, be in the shop for nine, and then their clock will start when they get the first customer at some point. Um, how how widespread that is uh, there's there's been um a call for evidence and there has been a uh, consultation now the consultation document uh consultation closed earlier in march and its stated aim was to maximize opportunities for zero hours contracts while minimizing abuse by setting out core protective standards and these core standards are supposed to relate to transparency and uh, and there is concern about exclusivity clauses if you're not giving anybody any guaranteed hours. Uh, the document is an absolute shining example of the best civil service drafting known in that it's a good 50 pages and says absolutely nothing. I, I managed to get from it three bullet points having read all 50 pages. So we'll see what they do with the answers to the consultation. Uh, but really, I end with a reminder that this is not, uh, as some would have us believe, a blank sheet of paper uh, where zero hours contracts are being used for the first ever time. We do have a body of case law and we've seen um, fairly recently the G4S and Alfonso case where a, an, a security guard um, actually requested to go on to a zero hours contract for personal reasons. And the legal background to consider this claim goes back to the cases that you've heard Paul talk about earlier. It goes back to uh, Clark and Oxfordshire Health Authority, Carmichael uh, and National Power. We've known for a long time that for there to be a, a global contract of employment, it's not necessary to, but in every case for that to be an obligation to provide work and perform work. Um, so, G4S, uh, his honour Judge McMullen, unusually, you might think or not, uh, cited his own earlier judgment uh, in Cushy and Stringfellows uh, and said that the starting point is the relationship on the occasion where the work is actually done. And he talked about uh, umbrellas uh, and where when you put the umbrella up, whether it is around the days on which work is not done or on the days when it is done. And uh, Claire Bosher Murray, in her talk, uh, spoke of the old chestnut, which isn't very helpful uh, when, looking at, when looking to advise or to litigate, but that every fact of the, the facts of each individual case are, are what is uh, essential to examine. And so that particular case was remitted and can be discussed over uh, my clip art picture upstairs. Thank you.